Good evening, good evening. Welcome along to Skeptics in the French 2020. Normally that gets a big cheer, but obviously we're online this year, so um, I'm not going to get any feedback, which is a bit annoying, but hey. Um, obviously our French events have been a little curtailed, um, but every year for the past 10 years we've done 23 events as part of the French in the Banshee Labyrinth. So this year, because of COVID, we've moved online. But we've only uh, had time and the resources to do three events this year. Um, so before we go any further, though, um, what I want to say is the Edinburgh Fringe, uh, well, as every year, we use the PPH Free Fringe and they support us and help on help put on these events every year. And because it's not on, it's going to struggle for money. And they really ensure that the Fringe is accessible to performers, to the public at no cost. So rather than help us, we're doing okay. Can you donate a few quid to help them come back next year even stronger? So if you can afford it, a few pound, a fiver, whatever, it's paypal.me, M-E, forward slash free fringe. So go and help them if you can. That would be really appreciated. So tonight, um, we've got a talk, obviously, online. It's about 50 minutes, roughly, to an hour. At the end of it, we're going to have a, a break. Uh, you can grab a drink, come for a break, whatever you need to do. And then a quick Q&A. And we're hoping to have a, a Zoom chat afterwards. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Curtis is not going to be able to join us, but we will have a Zoom chat to discuss the, the, the uh, talk. So last week, in case you missed it, we had Carmen de Cruz of London Skeptics, who was talking about critical thinking and race. If you missed the talk, you can catch up with it online. If you just go to edinburghskeptics.co.uk forward slash 2020, you'll find a link on there to, to watch it again on YouTube. Next week, we've got Dr. Emma Bryant, who's joining us from the USA. Um, she's been researching Cambridge Analytica and the response by academia to the Facebook scandal. That should be really interesting. Again, that's 8 o'clock on Tuesday next week. But this week, we've got the British political scientist, Professor Sir John Curtis. Uh, he's currently the Professor of Politics at the University of Strathclyde and a Senior Research Fellow at the National Centre for Social Research. He serves as President of the British Polling Council, Vice Chair of the Economic and Social Data Services Advisory Committee, and is a member of the Editorial Board of the Journal of Elections. He's the chief commentator at whatscotlandthinks.org, which provides a comprehensive collection of materials on public attitudes towards how Scotland should be governed and on electoral politics in general. But you probably know him better from his appearances on TV during broadcast coverage of general elections in the UK, where he gives his accurate predictions of the results in 2005, 2010, 2015 and in 2017. He's one of the most respected and listened to experts on polling by all sides of the political spectrum, even if he often reports things politicians may not often want to hear. Now, recent polling has shown a shift towards independence in Scotland. The 2014 referendum had the yes-no vote of 45 to 55 percent. But following Brexit and a shift in England to a more right-wing conservative government, there's now a majority for yes. At least that's what some recent polls seem to show. But is this just a reaction to the shift in England, or is it a sign of something more long term? So I'm now going to hand you over to Professor Curtis, who's far better placed than me to answer that question. So take it away, Professor Curtis. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, indeed. What I want to look at um, this evening is the story that lies behind the fact that uh, during the course of this year, the polls have begun for the first time in Scottish polling history to suggest that there uh, might now be a majority in favour of Scotland becoming an independent country. Um, to try to give you some idea as to why this seems to have come about, and it's, it's more than simply a sim simple single story. Um, and also then along the way also um, to give you some idea as to how uh, the changing contours of the constitutional debate in Scotland during the course of the last five years has also had an impact on the character of support for political parties and indeed the prospects for the parties in the Hollywood election uh, next year. But let's go back, first of all, uh, back to uh, the beginning. Um, as uh, Sean's already mentioned, back in September 2014, 
the outcome was yes, 45, no, 55. A much narrower result in truth than most unionists had anticipated um, uh, when uh, the UK government back in 2012 acquiesced uh, in the request for a referendum. Indeed, for example, as to Carmichael, sometimes second, a Liberal Democrat, Secretary of State for Scotland anticipated that there would be a 70% vote for uh, staying inside the UK. And almost undoubtedly part of the motivation and the expectation of those on the unionist side was, well, like if we hold this referendum, then finally the sword of Damocles that's been hanging over us uh, with respect to Scotland's membership of the, of the uh, UK will finally be removed. Uh, and we can get on to the ordinary politics of managing Scotland within a devolved framework and as part of the United Kingdom without worrying yet further about whether or not there's going to be other uh, demands for further powers or independence north of the border. Well, although the unionists did win, uh, the outcome was much narrower than certainly we've anticipated if we were talking about the polls back in 2012, um, and certainly much narrower than the uh, no side anticipated. And as a result of that, therefore, basically, the debate, rather than being stopped, continued. Not, however, that it evidently con uh, changed very much so far as the distribution of attitudes was concerned. Now, the two ways of looking at this. On the one hand, support for independence remained typically at around the 45% mark. This is all the polls uh, about how people would vote in another referendum between September 2014 and the June 2016 EU referendum. The green line are the people who said no, the blue line are those who said yes. And as you can see, usually the green line is above the blue line. There's a bit of fluctuation there. And, you know, if you were trying to put, trying to put a straight line uh, to summarise uh, those uh, two uh, 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 trends, you would basically have two parallel lines at roughly the 45% to 55% mark. Nothing obviously changed. Now, that do does therefore mean that the uh, increase in support for yes that occurred between 2012 and 2014 didn't seem now to be baked into the baseline in Scotland and that therefore indeed uh, Scotland's future membership of the United Kingdom remained a problematic uh, position, um, but equally no evidence that this was some continuing bandwagon that was moving inevitably towards uh, uh, another referendum or another yes vote. And indeed the, the SNP themselves during this period set themselves quite a high bar before they said that they would want to hold another referendum and essentially they told us that they would be they would only be looking to hold another referendum when the polls had yes at about 60 percent over a consistent period which was kind of suggested was perhaps at least a year. In other words you don't, you'd only hold another referendum when it was obvious that the yes side were going to win. Um, and we certainly weren't approaching that condition being satisfied. But then, of course, along came Brexit. And Brexit uh, potentially raised questions about uh, Scotland's relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom. Because, of course, as just reminding you here, Scotland voted very differently from England and Wales so far as the question on the 2016 ballot paper was concerned. Uh, Scotland voted almost two to one in favour of Remain, whereas England and Wales narrowly voted in favour of Leave. Um, and of course, far more people in England and Wales than there are in Scotland, and therefore Scotland has found itself uh, heading out of the European Union as a result of votes cast south of the border. Now, of course, it's long been one of the arguments on the nationalist side of the debate that one of the risks that Scotland takes in remaining part of the United Kingdom is that its democratic wishes, quote unquote, um, uh, may be overturned by the views of voters uh, down south that are rather less, uh, rather different from those north of the border. And this certainly looked like a perfect illustration of that argument from the nationalist point of view. Um, and that therefore, certainly, I think many inside the nationalist movement anticipated um, that Brexit would help to create more favourable conditions from their point of view, so far as gathering support for uh, independence. And indeed, within 24 hours of uh, the uh, EU referendum result being declared, 
uh, Nicola Sturgeon was already beginning to talk about how that this indeed did represent a material change of circumstance, which has been the condition that had been laid down in the 2016 SNP manifesto before they'd contemplate holding another referendum. Um, and so uh, indeed between uh, 2016 and the spring of 2017, um, uh, we reached a point where uh, Ms Sturgeon actually did get the Scottish Parliament to vote in favour of a motion to say that uh, she wanted another referendum. We'll come back to that story as we go along. Now, although therefore the outcome of the referendum looked as it were not unhelpful from a nationalist perspective, it was actually a deeply disruptive event and potentially an event that made life at least as difficult for those on the yes side of the argument as those on the no side of the argument. Because basically, um, support, whether or not you voted remain or leave, despite the SNP's, what, 25-year-old standing position of uh, favouring independence within the framework of the European Union, so despite the fact that you know, for a quarter of a century it's been a validly pro-EU party, actually those who voted uh, yes in 20. 14 were only a little more likely than those who had voted no to vote remain. And there are around one in three of those people who had voted yes in 2014 voted to leave. And any observer of uh, the SNP and its character has long since known that there's always been a body of national support that said, what's the point of liberating ourselves from London? only to put ourselves into chains, chains with Brussels. So perhaps therefore it was not as surprising as perhaps it might have felt to some of those in the nationalist movement that fairly soon it looked as though actually Brexit was not going to make much difference to the levels of support for yes and no. So again, this is again looking at the same kind of graph. No is the green line. Blue is the red line, uh, is the yes line. There were two or three polls in the very, very immediate days, immediately after the EU referendum, which had yes ahead, and that caused a certain amount of excitement. But fairly rapidly, by the time we, we were well into July, uh, the polls had no ahead again. And as you can see, basically throughout 2016, 2017, and 2018, at which, uh, which is the point at which this graph stops for the time being, we're still looking at two parallel lines which are roughly at 45 for yes, 55% uh, for no. Indeed, that was exactly the average of all the polls conducted in 2018. But although in aggregate, little had changed, actually underneath a great deal was happening um, and the character of support for nationalism and unionism was being restructured by the Brexit debate. Now, here's the first piece of evidence of what was going on. This is polling done by YouGov in the late summer and autumn of 2016. So pretty much within the immediate wake of the um, EU referendum. And what the slide is showing you is uh, separately for yes and no voters, the proportion who said they would vote the same way again, but broken down for both camps into those who voted remain and those who voted leave. And what you should note is that those people who voted yes and remain were much more likely to say that they would vote yes again in another independence referendum. And equally on the no side, those who voted leave were much more likely to say that they would vote no again than were those who had voted remain. In other words, Brexit does what had dislodged some people from their former preference, but that basically, at least during this period, um, given particularly that this, uh, um, for every person who voted no and remain, who had switched to yes, there was another person who had voted yes and leave, who switched towards no, thereby leaving the aggregate impact of uh, the EU referendum at zero. But what was emerging was a new divide that was reshaping the character of support for yes and no. So now I'm tracking you now through how support for independence 
was up to and including the 2014 referendum unrelated to people's views about the European Union, as you might guess I've already shown you, but how subsequently that changed. Now, exhibit number one here is not actually using how people voted in the 2014 referendum, because I'm wanting to track uh, what has happened since before that referendum. So this is a question that Scottish Social Attitudes asked, for where independence is one of a number of options, including um, you know, uh, uh, more devolution, um, uh, devolution without tax powers, et cetera, et cetera. You will see as we go from 2013 through to more recently that there clearly is more support for independence and therefore you can see the long-term impact of the referendum. But just go back to 2014. Remember that endless argument during the 2014 independence referendum about whether or not an independent Scotland would or would not be able to be a continuing member of the European Union if it were to become an independent state? Or would it have to apply? The claim of the unionists was that Scotland would have to apply and therefore there was no guarantee that it would be able to get in and it might have to pay more for the privilege, it might have to sign up to the euro um, and there might well be a gap um, uh, in its membership. Uh, those on the SNP side say, no, 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 we'll, we will be able to uh, carry on the existing membership. And the European Union sometimes made some not terribly helpful noises from the SNP perspective. Well, fascinating um, and intellectually uh, interesting debate as it was, it was a complete waste of time politically. Because actually, if you were a Eurosceptic, by which I mean somebody who either felt we should get out or that certainly we should be diminishing the EU's powers, you were just as likely, I mean, slightly more likely in 2014 to vote yes than you were if you were a Europhile, somebody who felt the European Union's power should be at least uh, at their current level, if not stronger. And that continues to be the case in 2015, after the EU referendum. But notice 2016, which is, this is a reading taken after the Brexit referendum, and you will notice how at this point, pretty rapidly, Europhiles are more likely to be in favour of independence than are Eurosceptics, and that gap widens further in 2017. So this is that resorting process that I showed you from YouGov's polls, now also playing out in the Scottish Social Attitude Survey that I have a certain amount of responsibility for, which we try to write every year. Same thing, um, showing you now uh, the story, actually looking at how people either did or would vote um, in a second referendum. Again, back in, in the referendum itself, Eurosceptics, if anything, slightly more likely to have voted yes than Europhiles. But after the EU referendum, uh, they, uh, it's very clear that Europhiles are much keener in favour and the gap widens further in 2017. So you can see how, therefore, the character of support for independence was being reshaped. And this also had political consequences. Political consequences which, however, for the most part, both Scottish politicians and the Scottish commentariat largely missed. Um, I remind you again, uh, by the time we got to spring of 2017, um, Nicola Sturgeon had got the Scottish Parliament to put in a formal request or a formal, pass a formal motion asking the Scottish government to request that there are permission from the UK government, that there should be another referendum. Uh, Theresa May said no, she didn't quite say no, never, but certainly said uh, uh, the time is certainly not currently ripe and certainly implied it wouldn't be until after uh, the, the next UK election, which at that point uh, we still thought was going to be in 2020. Um, um, uh, and then the SNP suffered a reverse back from the 50% of 2020. 15 to 35% in 2017, widely interpreted as a rebuff by the Scottish electorate to the SNP's proposal for Indiref 2. Well, actually, if you think about it, how many people were going to vote Conservative on the grounds that they really believed in independence, but did feel that the SNP were honour bound to keep their pledge to vote that there should not be a, another referendum in a generation which was the uh, promise or the, the threat, probably actually more accurately, um, that, to which the, uh, uh, the Conservatives were keen that the SNP should keep. If you think about the logic of it, it doesn't make much sense. And what I'm showing you here is actually 
the real story of 2017, which um, has now been shown by more than one piece of academic research. So again, back in 2015, when the SNP were at their height and winning 50% of the vote, they basically were doing almost as well amongst Leave voters as they did amongst those who had voted Remain. And the same was essentially true in the 2016 Holyrood election. But notice that between 2016 and 2017, support for the SNP falls heavily amongst Leave voters, whereas it only uh, falls down a, a, a relatively small amount, I should say five, four points rather than five points, um, amongst um, those who voted Remain. So the SNP were, for the most part, keeping their Remain vote, which you now know is also now quite heavily a yes vote. Um, it was losing ground amongst the Leave vote, which you now know was quite heavily um, also a no vote. Um, but that's what was the principal explanation of the decline of the SNP vote in 2017. And equally, despite Ruth Davidson's leadership of the Scottish Conservative Party, and despite the fact that Ruth Davidson was one of the most committed Remain advocates during the 2016 referendum, as you can see, all of the increase in support for the Conservatives in 2017 occurred amongst Leave voters. Basically, what was going on was exactly the same things happened south of the border, which was that Leave voters were mo moving towards the Conservatives in the belief that the Conservatives were the only party that were likely to deliver Brexit. And that had much the same effect north of the border as it did south of the border. So in many respects, therefore, and this is important for understanding you know, the extent to which Dr. Tross is going to make a difference as compared with Jackson Carlaw, given the shadow of Boris Johnson. Actually, the success of the Conservatives in 2017, in my view, occurred despite more than because of Ruth Davidson. Um, but in any event, certainly what's clear is that you can see how Brexit was now reshaping the character of party politics in Scotland, as well as the character of support for independence. What was also true at this point in time, um, and this is something I'll come back to later on, is that support, is that the um, uh, people's views about Brexit was also now beginning to shape their views about the economic consequences of independence. And undoubtedly one of the crucial disadvantages from which the uh, side suffered back in 2014 is they never really convinced people, or at least convinced enough people, that uh, independence would mean that Scotland would be economically better off. Um, those people who were persuaded during the course of the referendum did switch to yes, but there weren't enough of them. Um, and as you can see, back in 2014, both Eurosceptics and Europhiles were pretty uh, of a piece of in, in saying that, you know, basically Scotland is going to be worse off. Notice, however, by 2017, that Europhiles were saying, well, actually, might be Scotland might be even worse, because, of course, these are people who tended to be rather pessimistic about the economic consequences of Brexit. So for them, arguably, the question had changed its meaning. It was not necessarily, uh, would Scotland be better or worse off as compared with the United Kingdom inside the EU, but rather as compared with the United Kingdom outside the EU, a prospect that to them looked less favourable. Um, and meanwhile, Europe, Eurosceptics, on the other hand, were still fairly doubtful about the economic case for independence. So some of the other things that are relevant to the uh, debate about independence, e.g. perceptions of economic independence, are also now being reshaped by Brexit. Still, Christmas 2018, still not, you know, all of this intellectually fascinating for academics, raises questions about our understanding, yes, of the what happened in the 2017 election, but arguably didn't really make much difference so far as Scotland's future constitutional position is concerned. Well, then we came to the polls last year and this year. So here I'm um, uh, starting with um, uh, now the polls. Um, uh, we're really uh, going again, uh, showing you what we had before in 2016 and uh, 2017 and 2018. But then notice as we get to 2019, as we move towards the right hand side of this graph, um, whereas hitherto the polls 45 yes, 55 no, they narrow. 
and they narrow consistently. The green line is only just above the blue line for most of the polls in 2019, and occasionally it isn't. And indeed, on average, across all the polls in 2019, it's yes, 49, no, 51. So the first crucial thing to realize, going back to the question that Sean was raised right, right at the beginning, well, you know, is this some short-term phenomenon, some, uh, or is this something you need to take notice of? But it's important to realize that the rise in support for independence is now over 12 months old. This is a pretty long-running story. It's one that's only recently, as it were, reached wider attention. But for those, those of us who follow these things, have been waiting for quite a while now. Actually, you do need to realise that things have changed. And then, of course, you will also see as we get to the far right-hand side and we get into the polls for 2020, we're beginning to get polls that have yes quite a long way ahead and most of the polls with yes ahead. Um, and we'll come back to understanding why that happened um, in a while. So why then, or how do we understand this increase in support for yes in 2019, given that hither, so far at least it looked as though the reshaping of the character support for independence wasn't making any difference to the aggregate level of support. But here's uh, the explanation. So what I'm now doing is tracking in a way that was similar uh, that I showed you previously using data from School of Social Attitudes, but I'm now tracking the people, how people say they would vote in another referendum uh, from 2018 through to basically last week, separately for Remain voters and Leave voters. And as you can see, um, even actually in 2018, Amongst Remain voters, it was 50-50 because I've already shown you how already, um, uh, 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 even before 2018, Remain supporters have become rather more pro-yes. But, you know, 50% of Remain and 34% of Leave doesn't get you a majority. It still leaves you at about 45%. But then notice that the polls last year, both those done between April and October and then those done uh, as the general election was taking place in 2019, all of the support for yes occurs amongst actually amongst new voters. Support for independence is anything is declining further. Support amongst remain voters is increasing. And that continues to be the position in the polls that are conducted as uh, the United Kingdom left the European Union on January the 31st this year. And at this point, uh, my view was, and it's still my view, is that, you know, whatever your views, whatever, however you would like the world to be, however much you feel that Scotland is an integral member of the United Kingdom, and it is perfectly reasonable that Scotland should be leaving the European Union along with the rest of the UK as a result of the democratic vote that took place in 2016. That might be the way that you look at the world. It may be the way you would like the world to be, but you now have to understand that that is not how the world looks for many of your fellow Scots. And that by the time we were getting to the 2019 general election, it was pretty clear that the pursuit of Brexit was now undermining support for the union. Um, and that, that indeed was, as it were, uh, collateral damage to the unionist cause in Scotland that was being caused by uh, that uh, uh, UK government public uh, UK government policy. So headline number one of what I have to say this evening is that Brexit has indeed been crucial. You know, sometimes people use the word surge. Surge is too strong. Going from 45 to 49 or 50 percent is not a surge. It's a modest increase. But of course, given that we were starting from that relatively high baseline of 45%, it doesn't, didn't take a great deal of movement. It didn't take probably a large number of voters to change their minds to get us to the point where the polls are saying, well, frankly, don't ask us who would win another, another um, independence referendum. Um, it's all uh, up on the toss of the coin. But then notice, um, and again, this is something I'll pursue a little bit further in a moment. Notice that when we get to the right-hand side, and here... We are looking at the polls that have been done basically since the lockdown. 
Yes, support for independence has gone up amongst those who voted Remain, but it has now also gone up amongst those who voted Leave, which suggests that the further increase in support for independence, such that we now have a majority in favour, according to the polls, has not been driven by the same process that I've been explaining has been going on ever since June 2016 through to last December's general election. But again, just to uh, drive the point home um, and to show you again how uh, this is panning out, this is from the YouGov poll for the Times that came out last week. Again, doing the same analysis that I showed you that YouGov did uh, back in the autumn of 2016. So again, it's showing uh, the probability of yes and no voters saying they'd vote the same way again, bro broken down separately according to whether they voted for Remain or Leave in 2016. And again, as you can see, if anything, now there's an even bigger gap. Uh, so 95% of those who voted yes and Remain say they'd vote yes again. Only 70% of those who voted yes and no give that answer. And equally on the uh, other side of the fence, Leave voters are much more loyal than Remain voters. Now you can look at that and say, well, actually, you know, these are just two mirror images. Um, and then actually Leave voters are, yeah, sure, there's some, the, a proportion of Leave voters have wandered off uh, to uh, the Yes side, but a similar proportion of Remain voters have wandered off in the direction of No, therefore net effect is zero. Well, at this point, of course, this is where one has to realize a crucial arithmetic fact, which is that there are far more Remain voters in Scotland than there are uh, Leave voters. And if basically uh, the if Brexit is having a proportionate similar impact on the willingness of, rem of yes and no voters to vote the same way, the aggregate effect is eventually going to be disadvantageous to the union side. Because the more the Leave vote, uh, the no vote becomes embedded in, new, in, in Leave voters, the more that it is pursuing a minority market. Um, okay, but then how do we, uh, sorry, then one other final point just to, to note how again, um, Brexit then also sh uh, showed its head in the uh, December 2019 election north of the border when uh, the Conservative Party fell back somewhat and the, the SNP regained many of its losses. Uh, what happened? Well, indeed, the Conservative Party uh, lost such gains that it had made amongst Remain voters. It was back to where it was in, back in 2015. And so all of the Conservative revival now uh, by 2019 is wholly based amongst those who voted Leave, amongst whom basically the party uh, kept its support, but it's a niche market. Uh, meanwhile, the SNP becomes even more of a Remain vote than it even had been in 2017. And it's now, you know, the SNP basically has become the Remain party of Scotland, but at the same time is the one Remain party that can still get a substantial minority of uh, the Leave vote. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the Labour Party is having such, such trouble because the Labour Party, which gobbles up a large proportion of the main vote down south, is struggling north of the border. Okay, so how do we explain the more recent increase? And as you might imagine, this is where we come to obviously the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the first thing one has to say here is that the evidence is rather more circumstantial. In that I've been able to show you so far, you know, directly that voters who have a certain view about Brexit have been the ones who have been more likely to switch towards yes. And you've been able to see how uh, the structure, the relationship between attitudes towards the EU and attitudes towards independence has changed over time. I can't show you the same thing with coronavirus. The tables published by the polls don't do that. Whatever I think I can present you with this with some pretty strong circumstantial evidence um, and also you know a little bit of context that I think also uh, uh, illustrates this. So let me walk you through this. I, the first thing I think one has to say, you know, we spent years talking about you know how devolution has resulted in some noticeable policy differences between Scotland and England, free personal care, free university tuition, etc. But in truth, 
no period has been more important in the 21 years of devolution than the last three months. Because in the last three months, rather than making interesting variations around an existing public policy framework, the Scottish government has been making life and death decisions. The Scottish government has been making decisions about what we can and can't do using powers that you would uh, find even in wartime as well as in draconian and in peacetime as being unprecedented. And because Scotland devolution is, uh, uh, public health is devolved, health is devolved, these crucial decisions were being made in Edinburgh, not in London, albeit obviously against the backdrop of what London was deciding. And the public face of handling the pandemic, well, in part it was Boris Johnson, but it was also in Scotland above all, Nicola Sturgeon. So crucial point, however, I think we need to, I want to make is that it's highly likely that if voters do have views about how coronavirus is being handled, that at least some people might think that this is sufficiently important that they might actually change their views about the question of independence. No other issue has been anything like as important or as high profile. And maybe, maybe this has the, therefore, it looks as though we have the potential ability to move. So that's, I think, the important contextual point to make. Then the second point to make, and I'm not going to attempt to go into an explanation as to why I think this case, I'm happy to deal with this in Q&A, but for the purposes of the argument here, what we have to understand is that although the Scottish government faced many of the same problems, over care homes, PPE, testing, actually, and you know the 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 the, the, uh, the uh, death rate per hundred thousand is only a little bit better than England. Um, actually, despite all of that perceptions of how Sturgeon and the Scottish government have handled coronavirus are very, very different from those of Boris Johnson and the UK government. Exhibit number one, three polls, all of which asked people in pretty much the same way, how well or badly do you think that Nicola Sturgeon's handling the coronavirus pandemic and how well Boris Johnson? Uh, first one was a BBC Scotland poll done in May, Second one was panel based early last month, and the final one is YouGov um, just a week or so ago. And as you can see, Nicola Sturgeon, four fifths of people in Scotland think she's been handling things well. Uh, Boris Johnson thinks they've been getting worse. And now uh, his figures are almost the reverse image of Nicola Sturgeon. So on this crucial issue, Edinburgh gets very high marks. London gets lousy marks. Moreover, what's true is that this gap has been anything wider. Now, you, Gav, have asked the same question here, not about Johnson and Sturgeon, but about how well the Scottish government has handled things and how well the UK government has handled things. They did it in April and they did it again last week. So in April, it was already the case that the Scottish government was getting more plaudits than the UK government. 74% were saying that the Scottish government were handling things well. Um, in the case of the UK government, only 47%, and as many people thought they were handling things badly, but at least the UK government was kicking in 50-50. You know, but repeated in August, and of course April is well at the height of lockdown before Dominic Cummings, etc. Uh, now, Scottish government, 79% doing well. Boris, uh, UK government, 73% badly. So things have actually got worse for the UK government as time has gone on. And in the wake of this, Nicola Sturgeon's popularity, which undoubtedly, you know, A, was, of course, it was stratospherically high when she first became First Minister and uh, led her party to a the stupendous result in 2015. It gradually diminished thereafter and certainly took a knock when the SNP did uh, rather disappointingly in the 2017 general election. Well, I just look at the right hand side, it's gone. Nicola Sturgeon's popularity in the latest YouGov poll is back up to the almost the stratospheric uh, post independence uh, levels 
uh, that we saw in the um, uh, uh, spring of uh, 2015. Um, uh, so, you know, this has un undoubtedly done a great deal in terms of her personal popularity. Now, you might then say to yourself, oh, but hang on, you know, this is just SNP voters and yes voters saying, of course, everything that Nicola does is great and she walks on water and everything that Boris does is hopeless and, you know, they're, they're bound to mark him down. That, however, is not the position. Now what I'm showing you, and this is just one of the three polls, but it's true of all of them, showing you both how Leave voters alone and no voters alone evaluate Sturgeon and evaluate Johnson. And notice that even amongst Leave voters and even amongst no voters, around three-fifths of them think that Sturgeon um, has been handling coronavirus well. And that in both within both groups, Sturgeon outpoints Johnson for his handling of coronavirus. So amongst Leave voters, Johnson's you know 50-50. Amongst no voters, actually Johnson's net rating is negative. So in the very, very constituency of people whom unionists need to keep aside, i.e., no voters, on this crucial issue, high profile issue, Sturgeon and the Scottish government are evaluated well ahead of the UK government. Um, so now point therefore too is that, you know, given that one of the uh, nationalist longstanding arguments in favor of independence is that an independent Scotland would be governing itself more effectively than would uh, a Scotland governed by the United Kingdom. You can see how perhaps we might anticipate not necessarily great many people, but a few people at least might go, you know what, I think they might have a point. In the wake of their perception of the difference in the way that the coronavirus has been handled by the two governments and the two first stroke prime ministers. And certainly to that circumstantial evidence, we can also add a bit of further evidence from the polls. It gets us pretty close uh, to knowing this data. It doesn't do so entirely. Exhibit number one comes from a panel based game from the panel based poll back at this is one done back at the beginning of June. Um, and here people were being asked. Has the handling of coronavirus made you more or less confident of um, Scotland becoming independent or Scotland being in the union? So the question asked of Sturgeon was, has the handling of, of, of COVID made you more or less confident about independence? In the case of Johnson, the question was, had it made you more or less confident about Scotland being part of the union? The figures are not dramatic, but you will notice that rather more people are monthly voters and slightly more amongst no voters said, yeah, actually, um, that they were now more confident of Scotland being able to govern itself as an independent country than people were saying that they were less confident. So in this crucial constituency, there's a substantial minority of people going, yeah, actually, I think maybe it stacks up a bit better now. Whereas when asked about how uh, Johnson's handling has uh, influenced them, they're saying, well, actually, I am now less confident of Scotland's ability to be governed effectively in the framework of the Union. Uh, and that's fairly clearly the case as far as no vote is concerned. Uh, second exhibit, and um, arguably crucial exhibit, um, now coming from the YouGov poll that came out last week. So this is a question that asked directly, do you think an independent Scotland would have handled uh, COVID-19 better or worse? Amongst voters in general, the answer is um, not overwhelmingly, but you know, far more people saying better than saying worse. Only 16% of people in Scotland think that coronavirus will be handled worse if Scotland were to be independent. Uh, yes, a lot of them are yes voters. Unsurprisingly, 70% of yes voters say yes. And crucially, only 4% say worse so, you know, coronavirus has, on these figures, only put at risk 4% of the yes vote. The others just said it wouldn't make any difference. 
Then note, then look at the figures for voters on the no side. Yes, slightly more about no, no voters that say that uh, Scotland would have handled the independent would have handled an independent Scotland would have handled COVID nineteen worse and so handled it better. But that's not the point. The crucial point is that one in five no voters said that coronavirus would have been handled worse. And that 20% figure has to be compared with the 4% of yes voters who said um, uh, uh, it, it would be worse. So th therefore, um, the, again, it looks as though COVID-19 has put a minority of the no vote at risk and that probably some of these 20% of folk, unfortunately, you can't tell it from the tables, have probably actually been amongst those who have shifted their view in favour of yes during the course of the last uh, three months or so. Now, of course, um, beyond this argument about, uh, so, so let me just do a quick up sum. So essentially, um, my central argument of the evening is this, is that support for independence has gone up for two separate reasons. The first is Brexit, which has become, for some people, a perfect illustration of a long-standing nationalist argument that for so long as Scotland remain, uh, remains part of the UK, it's at risk of having its democratic issues overturned. And two, it's coronavirus, which for those of a nationalist disposition has provided seemingly an excellent illustration of the argument that an independent Scotland would be able to govern itself more effectively. That's the central message of the evening. But let's just look, look, look a little bit about, you know, well, hang on, but does Scotland want a referendum? Um, where do we stand on that? Um, it's been a long-standing unionist argument that, you know, Scotland doesn't want one. So not only to the SNP keep their promises, but it's quite clear that the Scottish public want the SNP to keep their promises. Now, um, exhibit number one here on this is a question that panel base has been asking for quite a while now, really ever since the EU referendum. It's a bit complicated. It kind of asks people whether or not there should be a referendum during the course of the Brexit negotiations, once Brexit is over, and crucially, the red line, there shouldn't be one at all. And as you can see, as we got towards 2017, I and mean, certainly after the um, 2017 election, there was um, a, a clear majority view that actually there shouldn't be another referendum for the foreseeable future. And we're getting up to about almost 60% of people expressing that view, i.e. there was considerable disquiet on the yes side about the idea of, whole, of having a referendum. Whether they're being principled about it or simply being strategic, they'd read the polls is perhaps another matter. But as you will see more recently, as we get towards the right-hand side, then actually, um, the level of opposition towards holding referendum, at least at some point in the wake of the Brexit process, has gone back down to around the 50% mark, i.e. we get to being split around 50-50. So here, the unionist argument doesn't look as strong as it once did. Um, here's um, another uh, time series, somewhat shorter, from YouGov, simply asked whether there should be a referendum at some point in the next five years. And as you can see, for most of the time from 2017 through to at least last year, more people were saying there should not. That's the green line that was saying there should, the blue line. But last year, it got to 50-50. And in the most recent YouGov poll, we do now have a fairly clear plurality saying there should be another referendum. And crucially, with what is now likely to be the central SNP proposition in next year's Hollywood election, which is that there should be a referendum of the SNP on their own. And this is the SNP on their own, by the way, winning an overall majority. Then we now get slightly more people saying that there should be a referendum than saying there should not. So I think in truth now it has, shall we say, the foundations upon which the unionist argument has been resting for quite a while, that, look, you know, Scotland doesn't want another referendum, that those foundations do now look pretty weak. And as a result, the edifice upon which it is built is certainly at risk of significant erosion. We shouldn't be surprised because the honest truth is people's attitudes towards the questions whether there should be a referendum is not 
a principle. There, there are not people out there who are going, yes, well, I, you know, I'm an independent supporter, but you know, we shouldn't have a referendum now because the SNP said that there wouldn't be one for another generation. As you can see, this is one of many examples. This is actually from a poll in the autumn. Overwhelmingly, yes, voters say there should be another referendum, and overwhelmingly, no voters say there should not, i.e., people do not distinguish between the question of process and the question of substance. And therefore, it is not surprising, given that apparently now we have a majority of people in favour of independence, then equally also we are moving in the direction of having a, at least a plurality, if not a majority of people, in favour of another referendum. And to that extent, at least the two arguments go together. Um, there's a when people are being asked as to whether or not things have changed enough to justify holding an independence referendum, um, yes, voters are inclined to the view that they have. No voters are inclined to the view they have not. Surprise, surprise. Um, we, will, we all look at the world through the prism that reflects our partisan interests. So uh, quite a lot has changed, therefore, during the course of the last uh, three or four, year, four years which seems to underpin the strength in SNP position, both with respect to the substance of the Brexit issue, of the independence question, but also the process question of whether or not there should be another referendum. That doesn't mean, of course, that everything in the Nationalist Garden is rosy. Uh, let me just pick out a couple of areas where undoubtedly the S side will still have work to do. One is already mentioned earlier. One of the crucial difficulties the S side faced in 2014 was they did not persuade a majority of people that Scotland would be better off as a result of independence. Um, um, that's illustrated here um, by the last YouGov poll before the 2014 referendum, which is the second trio of columns in this slide. 45% of people saying Scotland would be worse off, 37% saying it would be better off. Um, YouGov, unfortunately not this month, but back in January, repeated that question, exactly the same question. And as you can see, the balance of opinion was still very much the same. Now, maybe it's moved on since, but alas, we don't know. Um, but on the evidence we have so far, there is still uh, uh, the need for progress on, uh, the, uh, on this issue. But as you will notice, amongst those who voted remain, slight plurality thinking that may now will be better off. It's amongst leave voters who say things would be worse off. So this is certainly an area still where the debate will undoubtedly be an important one if we ever get to a referendum. Second obvious issue is the question of currency. Not an issue, by the way, that I think operated to the, to the, to the advantage of the no side in the way that many people on the no side think, but certainly didn't work to the advantage of the yes side. And of course, the position of the SNP now is that independent Scotland should eventually embrace an independent uh, currency con in contrast to position back in 2014 when it said it should keep the pound in perpetuity. Well, the trouble is um, <laughs> the pound's rather popular and even amongst yes voters, only around 25% when this question was last posed, uh, felt that eventually uh, back to the now uh, SNP position of pound first uh, and a Scots currency later. Um, and this is still an area where, again, the yes side have an awful lot of work potentially to do. Still, that said, basically now what's going to matter and what is crucial is what happens in May of next year. I think the way in which the UK government have reacted to and the Scottish Conservative Party have reacted to the polling data of recent weeks. They've not disputed it. They have basically acknowledged that it looks as though the SI have made progress. And they are now pretty strongly signaled that they are very, very keen to try to stop the SNP winning an overall majority in May of next year. Trouble is, at the moment, at least, as you can see, the SNP are way ahead. Um, most recent polling has them well above 50%, which however you look at it, even with a PR system, is going to deliver an overall majority. What you should also notice, however, by the way, is actually the Conservatives are not doing that badly. They're at around 20%. They're just slightly below what they got in the Hollywood election of May 2016. 
A problem on the unionist side is the Labour Party. The Labour Party is back down to the very low figures of around 14, 15% that they were running up before the uh, 2016 uh, um, uh, 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 Hollywood election from which they did eventually recover. But one of the paradoxes of the position we're now in is that almost undoubtedly the Conservatives need a Labour recovery between now and next May if Boris Johnson is going to avoid the difficult situation of there being an SNP majority at Hollywood. Uh, and that's one of the paradoxes of the situation because at the end of the day, the difficulty that the unionist side faces, and you know, this slide speaks to debates going on inside the SNP, as well as to explaining the difficulty of the unionist movement. The crucial difference between yes voters and no voters is that yes voters are basically all in minded to vote for the SNP. So 86% of those people who voted yes in 2014 say that they're going to vote for the SNP next May. On the right hand side, I'm showing you the distribution of support amongst no voters, while the SNP are picking up some of them because some of them are now, as I've shown you, in favour of yes. But just notice the fragmentation of the no vote basically between four parties. And there is a certain parallel between this situation and the one that pertained in December 2019. Why did the Conservatives win a majority of 80 in December 2019? It actually wasn't because more people voted for pro-Brexit parties than for anti-Brexit parties. Actually, the opposite was true. What was true was that the Leave vote was very heavily united behind the Conservative Party, with around 75% of Leave voters voting for the Conservatives, whereas the Remain vote was fragmented between Labour and the Democrats and in Scotland, the SNP. So the very phenomenon of one side of a constitutional debate being concentrated in terms of its party politics and the other side being fragmented that delivered Boris Johnson the majority that enabled him to pursue Brexit could also be the phenomenon that makes it very difficult for him to avoid a nationalist majority in the Hollywood next year and leaving the SNP with a mandate that will look as strong as anything that Boris Johnson claims off the back of the 2019 election. So um, that's some of, therefore, the difficulty that now faces those on uh, the unionist side, albeit, as I said, uh, there are still, they've got some cards that they can play. Uh, I'm not going to repeat all of this. I should hope by now it's all pretty clear and pretty obvious uh, as to uh, the conclusion that, I, that I'm coming to, which is that basically, yes, indeed. Now, not only is it the case that arithmetically, the position now is different from anything we've known in the past, but also now there's some pretty important structural reasons as to why this has happened, which certainly potentially will make it quite difficult for the um, parties, the unionist parties in May and in any referendum thereafter, um, as Scotland's constitutional debate uh, 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 carries forward in the next 12, 18 months, two, three years, however long it goes, it goes on for. Thank you very much, Professor Curtis. That was really fascinating and extremely detailed. Uh, I learned a hell of a lot from that, so thank you very much. Um, before we go, um, we're going to have a little break for about 10 minutes or so um, for, before we come back for a QA. and a but before we go, I'm just going to let you know of a few events coming up. So our colleagues in Skeptics of the Pub, which is a kind of national group that we're part of, they're putting on weekly events online very similar to this. And on Thursday the 20th, we've got a chap called Anthony Magnabosco, who is part of a group called Street Epistemology. Um, and so he'll be talking about how he talks to people gently using questions to try and probe their beliefs. It's very interesting uh, 
process. That's on 7 o'clock on Thursday the 20th. If you just search Skeptics in the pub, Skeptics with a K, of course. And next week, we've got uh, Dr. Emma Bryan, as I said, joining us from America, who has been researching Cambridge Analytica and the response by academia to the Facebook scandal. Really looking forward to that one. So we're Skeptics in the pub. Sorry, we're Skeptics in, in Edinburgh. We're part of Skeptics in the pub. Uh, we put on regular monthly events in the Banshee Labyrinth in Edinburgh. When it's safe to do so, we will be back in the pub. So please come and join us if you're in Edinburgh or Central Scotland. Until then, we're going to be putting on regular events every month, um, the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, we'll announce them on Facebook, Twitter, meet up all the usual places. And we're trying to get all our events available as podcasts. If they're, uh, or if they're not available as podcasts or additional to being available as podcasts, we'll put the YouTube link as well and you can watch them again on YouTube. So uh, please type your questions in uh, the YouTube link or tweet us at Skeptics Lockdown. So we'll be back in 10 minutes or so. So it's now nine o'clock. So we say 10 past nine. Uh, Professor Curtis, you okay for Q&A at that point? Hopefully we'll have some nice questions for you. So thank you very much and see you in about 10 minutes.
one from Ewan Duthie. Um, has anyone studied the swap set? Is there any data on what the voters who have changed their minds are saying caused a change of mind? No, um, we don't have that kind of data. I mean, th this is where we get a little bit into the philosophy of social science. Um, uh, there are some people who think that the best way of finding out about things is to ask people why they've done something. There are others of us who go, well, actually the chicken doesn't necessarily know why it crossed the road where it did. Uh, and that what you need to understand is the structure of the, ro of the road and the pavement, et cetera, et cetera. And that basically you infer or attempt to infer causation, dangerous though it sometimes is, uh, from uh, correlation. Um, so, um, you know, a, a bit, uh, somebody who is primarily doing quantitative research and primarily uh, therefore uh, it tends to be somebody in, in that second camp. But um, to be honest, I'm, you know, I'm not aware of anybody who's done as yet a study of the people who've changed their minds uh, since 2014. I mean, doubtless, if we ever do get there to being a referendum, then um, we will get much more in the way of academic research in the area. I mean, uh, the Scottish independence referendum resulted in a whole load of um, uh, research, some of which I was relying on for this talk. Um, the EU referendum did, which again, is, again was relying on for this talk. But you know, a lot of what we're reliant on at the moment um, is uh, political um, uh, opinion polling, which is itself relatively thin on the ground because of the state of the newspaper industry. And again, you know, um, Scottish Social Actions, which tries to run every year, it couldn't run a lot in 2018, it ran in 2019, and we will be releasing results from that soon. But, you know, 2020 is scuppered by coronavirus because we, we, we rely on interviewing people um, <coughs> face to face. And we certainly can't do that. We might try to do something else. So, um, but, uh, you know, the truth is, um, if and when um, we do go to a referendum, then I'm sure I suspect somebody will put in a grant application to say, well, we should study the people who have uh, changed their minds and try to uh, ascertain the reasons that they give. And, and sure, not all of them will necessarily give the reason that I've suggested seems to be mm -hmm. uh, central. And of course, you know, th there are always folk who you know, move in both directions for reasons that have nothing to do. But I think I would be very surprised if we were to discover that so far as you know, what explains the aggregate shift as opposed to all of the individual shifts. You know, mm -hmm. It's kind of the two things that I pointed out. Now, whether the coronavirus effect will last, you know, will outlast the coronavirus pandemic itself is, of course, a moot point and an interesting question. The one thing we do know, of course, and which is why these two things are different, Brexit will still be with us after the pandemic. <laughs> coronavirus may or may not recede in the memory and may or may not leave lasting imprint. But even if that goes, we are still looking at a world where you know, support is likely to be around 50 50 mark. Mm. And of course, I presume people will tell you the reason, but it may not actually be the reason in the heart. Yeah, of course. They, and people you know. don't know. And we don't, uh, you know, I mean, it depends on your view. I mean, not, people don't necessarily know the reason as to why they do things. You can't because, put the finger on a single thing. And, and, and insofar as people will give you reasons, they will often lift the reasons from what they've heard in the political discourse, right? So if you ask somebody, why did you do something? You don't necessarily know whether you're getting the reason or you're getting the, the self-justification. <laughs> right? yeah. that, that, that's not to impugn people's motives. You know, that's just life. Yeah. OK. Yeah. But we're, we're not always the best judges of, of, of what we did. But, you know, the kind of work that I do basically relies on inferring causation from patterns of correlation, or in this case, the fact that, you know, it's just one group of voters going in one direction, another group of voters going in the other direction. You can just see what's going and how it's just so, so clearly being structured by a particular phenomenon. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Chris Nicholson, to switching from yes to no and no to yes, region by region in Scotland, like in places like Glasgow or Aberdeen. Um, again, sorry to disappoint you, but... Um, <laughs> With polls of a thousand people, which is what many of these are, occasionally there are 1,500, um, they're just not big enough to be able to answer that question. Um, you know, what, I mean, uh, what is true? I mean, I have done some work that isn't yet published about, you know, what happened in 
the election in 2019. So you can begin to get some understanding about geography um, by looking at election results, which you know do give us some geography, right? And basically that suggests that, you know, um, there's a bit of a link, there's a bit of a link. And so, so the places that voted most likely to vote leave, which of course is the Northeast, yeah, yeah. are the places where certainly the conservative vote was most likely to hold up. And I've already shown you the individual level data that the conservatives were hanging on to leave voters. Um, so you can probably th th therefore re reasonably anticipate that the no vote is relative to 2014, probably stood up best in the Northeast, which is where there are mostly voters. And that conversely in the more remain parts of Scotland is where the yes side are more likely to have advanced. So to be the more, you know, uh, university um, middle class parts of uh, Scotland with lots of young people where that will happen to particularly, you know, the, you know, the, the, the cities, etc. cetera. Um, but um, that's probably about as good as we can, we can get so far. Mm -hmm. Of course, at the end of the day, um, in contrast to a Westminster election, the geography is irrelevant. Uh, I suppose, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's one vote. <laughs> so the next question is from Kenny Matheson. So regardless of the polls, do you see a practical pathway towards independence? Boris Johnson's never been overburdened with a sense of shame. Won't he simply continue refusing to grant an, a referendum? Yeah, that's the $64,000 question. So um, let's lay out a, a, a few things first. I think the, the first assumption one has to make is that the SNP say in their 2021 manifesto that they want a referendum. Full stop. Um, my own view is that those who are arguing that the SNP should articulate a plan B are making a mistake because if the SNP say in their manifesto, well, we're, go we're going to hold a referendum and we're either going to hold it without the UK government saying yes or not, you let the UK government off the hook, all right? Um, that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't have a plan B. And I think the SNP do will need to have a plan B from their perspective, but I think it's not in their interest to articulate it publicly. And that's the bit that I think, you know, the Chris McAlennies of this world, uh, and Kenny McCarthy's world haven't quite got. If they want to maximize the pressure on the UK government, it has to be a very clear uh, vote because then the SNP can claim this is what people voted for. They voted for a referendum that they of the same kind as we had back in 2014. Now, yeah. of course, what is true is that you know Boris Johnson is will, will say, and he will say endlessly between now and May of next year. Look, the SNP said that there should, it was going to be a once in a generation event. And no, that's fine. You can say that you think your opponents should keep their campaign promises. What, however, you cannot do is to argue that the electorate are bound by the promises made by the SNP seven years ago, right? And this was particularly driven home to me by in a in a hustings that I chaired in Glasgow during last year's general election, when somebody from the audience said, "Look, you know, I've heard all you said about you know what you know the SNP says once generation event, but what will you accept as evidence that people in Scotland have changed their minds?" Because and the point, you know, the crucial thing about that was he was inviting the Conservative representative, of course, didn't answer the question, to say, "Well, look, okay." You don't think you don't think there should be a referendum? Fine, you're allowed to say that. Uh, but what is the threshold that you would accept as evidence that people have changed their mind? Because the point is, in a democracy, the electorate have the right to be fickle. Okay, yeah. so that I think is different. And of course, you know, the problem this current UK government will face is that all you have to say to them is, look, back in 2011, the SNP got an overall majority off the back of the same promise and you David Cameron accepted that they had the moral right to hold a referendum so what's different now right 
the public who voted as they did in 2011 for a given a majority to a party that wants a, wants a referendum. Again, I think getting the majority is crucial. If, if it's an SNP Green majority, it doesn't have the same force. It has to be SNP on its own. Then you've got the parallel with 2011. <coughs> and and yeah, I think the honest truth, that, that, so, so the point is that Boris Johnson will not want to have to answer the question, which is why the UK government will do its damnness and the Conservative Party will do its damnness to try and deny the SNP a majority. But the fact that they are putting so much effort into that and have, and have toppled a leader because of their concern about that is an indication that they realise that that matters. The next year's, there they are, they are implicitly accepting that what happens next May makes a difference. Now, thereafter, sure, we can, we can then play out various scenarios. I mean, um, but, but th this is the difficulty for the UK government. So one is already the precedent. Two is, um, um, doubtless, there may not be anybody else who's sufficiently anorak on this subject, but for those of you of a certain age, you will remember that between 2007 and 2011, the then minority SNP Scottish government came up with quite a lot of white papers about how you might hold a referendum on independence. And that included a proposal for holding a referendum under the auth sole authority of the Scottish Parliament, but a referendum in contrast to the Catalonian referendum would be ruled as constitutional and legal, right? And the wording of this, it was very convoluted, but it was essentially saying, so the referendum question they came up with that they argued would be various is do you agree that the Scottish government should enter into negotiations with the UK government with a view to Scotland becoming an independent country? So it was not directly about independence. It was an instruction to the Scottish government. And the legal argument was uh, that although the Union of the Crowns is a reserved matter, the Scottish government does have a locus with respect to um, uh, relationships with the UK government and also with respect to the powers, uh, uh, the division of the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Um, now, the truth is, when two or three, two or three constitutional lawyers were gathered together during the course of this uh, period, you got five or six different opinions as to whether or not it would get past the Supreme Court. But I think the thing to realise is that if the SNP's plan B is to go down that path, Sure, the UK government can then, I mean, there's the interesting question as to whether or not um, the presiding officer will regard the bill as ultra virus or not. And of course, there was a debate about that uh, in a previous uh, bill in this parliament. Um, but then, you know, ultimately, the UK government can take it to court and we might have the delicious sight of, the, of Boris Johnson asking the UK Supreme Court to rule a act of parliament as unconstitutional, which will be a certain delicious irony to it. Yeah. But the crucial point then to understand is that, you know, it might be 75, 80% probability that the UK government might win this case, but it's probably less than 100. And to that extent, at least, the UK government's position is not quite as strong as it thinks, as, 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 as simply being able to say, no, at least, to stop the Scottish government from holding a referendum. Now, of course, if it's not a referendum the UK government uh, recognises, then, you know, well, okay, we can hold the referendum, but the UK government says we're not entering negotiations. The thing I think then, however, because you, you, you've got to war game these things, right? And I think if you then war game it, so if we go down this path, we deny the referendum, despite the fact the SNP have a strong majority, um, the Supreme Court, does rule it as ultra virus, but you know, along the way, if the, ultra, if the Supreme Court does rule it as virus, well, then you're in shit street. If they, if they rule it ultra virus, well, the SNP will say, it just goes to show, we have to go. And then I suspect what the SNP might do would be to say, okay, is to go back to their position, what, before around 1990 or so, which is to say, if we win a majority of the seats, at the next Westminster election, we will regard that as a mandate for independence. Period. End of story. And will the Conservatives want, indeed will the Labour Party want, the next UK election be one in which 
the SNP are uh, account saying this is a vote on independence, one which if we you know, given the current structure of Scottish politics, very good chance of winning, um, and where there is a non-trivial probability that the SNP may well hold the balance of power um, uh, in, in that parliament. That's not necessarily a path down which you wish to tread. So you have to realize therefore that sure, there are all sorts of weaknesses on the SNP side. Um, and, you know, and, and above all, it is that you don't have the legal authority to hold a referendum and you certainly don't have the position to commit the UK government to acknowledging and, and accepting the result of such a referendum. But equally, there are also weaknesses on the UK side, which means that the UK government is going to have to have to war game very, very carefully what it how, how it proceeds next, uh, because there is a risk it ends up in a worse situation than it would be if it were to accept and fight the referendum in the first place. Got it. Do you think that the Tories bringing back Ruth Davidson is a kind of reaction to that? That the because obviously she had a, a, some popularity in Scotland, even amongst tra non-traditional Conservative voters. Well, Do you think bringing her back is, is a reaction to that? Well, um, I, I think getting rid of um, uh, Jackson Carlow was evidently a reaction <laughs> to the position of the polls. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, Ruth obviously is not available, but I've, but I've already said to you, you know, and this is the problem that the Scottish Tories face. So I've already said to you, I don't think with David matters as much in 2017 as people think. Yes. She, she is somebody who gains the respect of people who don't vote for the Conservatives, but they don't necessarily vote Conservative as a result, right? <laughs> and just say, you know, she's a bloody good politician, right? And they accept that and they respect that and they acknowledge it. Um, um, but it's not clear to me that um, uh, in 2017, uh, that she, she was that central. And that in particular, the fact that in the end, the character of the vote that the Conservatives won in 2017 seemed to owe much more to Theresa May than it did to uh, to Nicola uh, to to, uh, to, um, uh, the, 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 to the Conservative person is that yeah. um, the um, Boris Johnson is going as you've already shown. It, so the thing that binds the thing the the, the focal point that binds the story about Brexit. And the story about coronavirus, I've told you, is, of course, Boris Johnson. Right? And so uh -huh. the ability of the Scottish Conservatives to escape what at the moment is the shadow of Boris Johnson, so far as trying to win votes north of the border is concerned, is not going to be easy. Uh, and Douglas Ross, of course, is a known character. Uh, sure, um, uh, Ruth Davidson would, I mean, um, you know, she'll add a bit of bite um, uh, 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 to the Tories. Um, and I'm sure that if there were to be a referendum, that she would be an important character on the, on the no side. But yeah, I mean, here and there lies another difficulty for the unionists, which is finding somebody who could be the accepted spokesperson of that cause. Very difficult. Very, very difficult. Who is it going to be? Because you know the Labour Party won't accept the Tories anymore, but the Tories are now the larger party. Except, so that fragmentation of the unionist movement not only puts at a disadvantage in May, it will also put at a disadvantage in any referendum. Which is why some of us are also going say, saying to the you know, to, insofar as the internal St. Peter debate is concerned, you really do not wish to throw away your crucial hand at the moment, which is the, you're, not, you're united, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea of setting up a separate party in order to gain the system, uh, in order to try and ensure you get an overall majority, well, frankly, at the moment, you're gonna get an overall majority anyway. And you will get one that people won't say you cheated on, uh, but one where people would, would have to accept that you won fair and square. Um, but, you know, do not, you know, the unity of the nationalist movement is now potentially an absolutely crucial strength, both in May of next year and in any referendum or ballot that's held subsequently. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, I've got a question here from Chris Nicholson. How are Scottish voters viewing other devolved governments such as Wales and Northern Ireland, especially because of COVID-19 decision differences? That seems pertinent now, whereas before it wasn't. 
So is, is, is the question, how, how are people in Wales uh, are looking? No, how do Scottish voters view the other devolved governments? Oh, I'm any not polling on sure that? anybody has asked that because, of course, at the end of the day, um, I'm not sure how many people in England or in Scotland. I mean, you know, Mark Drakeford does not have the same uh, soundbite ability that Nicola Sturgeon has. So I think people in England have heard Nicola Sturgeon since the cars come home over coronavirus. She is always the alternative voice that's put up to speak for the yeah, department. It's just, just popular in England as well. Yeah. I mean, what, what I can say to you, however, is that we do, we do have, it's a while since we've had it, but certainly when there was last polling in Wales, um, again, Drakeford comes out relatively well and Johnson comes out badly. Actually, even in England, Sturgeon comes out well and Johnson comes out badly. I mean, even amongst voters in England, Sturgeon's ratings are markedly higher than Johnson's because, of course, John, I mean, John, I, mean you know, I, I, I won't go into the whole speech about Johnson's problems, but, you know, the, 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 you know there were two absolutely crucial events that undermined uh, Johnson's um, perceived competence on Brexit um, across the UK. One was that fateful speech that he gave uh, on a Sunday evening in the middle of May when he was beginning to, he announced he was going to ease the lockdown. And he was saying, you know, you're all going to go back to work. And people go, am I, am I, have I got to go, have I got to go to work tomorrow? And in terms of sowing confusion, and then eventually, kind of, oh, it doesn't quite mean that. Um, that was a disastrous. And then, of course, Dominic Cummings, which just was seriously eroded uh, people's perceptions as to how... Is the polling on, on what come instead and the reaction oh, to yes. that? Oh, yes. Well, there was, there was loads of it at the time. Um, and the crucial thing, about, and so, some of it was very, very intense. And basically what you just... And as the point was that even amongst Leave voters and even amongst Tory voters, they weren't convinced that Cummings had played by the rules. And crucially, even when this UK government kept on trying to defend him, the polls were just as bad a week after the story first came out as they were at the first one. So given that for a, any government in a pandemic, the crucial thing, the crucial power that it needs above all is the power of persuasion, there was a very strong limit. I mean, basically, it utterly failed to persuade the public on the question, or question of Cummings. And that just gets strange. And then more recently, there's been um, an academic study done uh, as part of an epidemiological study out of UCL, uh, which was published in the, in the Lancet, where, uh, you know, again, they kind of said, oh, you know, coronavirus seriously reduced trust in the Scottish government, in the UK government, suddenly coronavirus. Well, that'd be kind of new. Um, but what we also, they also then went on to argue is that this also uh, has served to undermine compliance with the COVID guidelines, um, which, of course, from their point of view, is what they're particularly concerned about. Um, yeah. But yeah, but politically, it's, it's clear that Cummings was a was you know a very a big and and you know for for for, for other reasons because I, I now have a project about how the public are uh, reacting to COVID nineteen other ways, um, and so I've read some of the literature about what happens during pandemics. Uh, and of course, Dominic Cummings is famous for reading the scientific literature. If he'd read the scientific literature on pandemics, he would have known how people would react because the scientific literature on pandemics says people get really censorious about people who are thought to be breaking the rules, breaking taboos, breaking social conventions. We become much more censorious and much less individualistic in a, pan in, in a pandemic situation. It, it's queue jumping, isn't it? It's a jump in the it, queue, it's, yeah. Exactly. And uh, so he read the literature, he would have known he was in trouble. <laughs> so do you think Johnson's perceived incompetence is actually causing any real reaction in England? Or is it too early to say? Um, it's caused some um, in that, um, you know, the, the, the Conservative lead, I mean, the conservative lead in the opinion polls is it varies a bit it's between about three and about nine um but and and, and it, it was stratospheric for a while until after Cor corbyn finally left the scene and starman took over and johnson began to, to to misstep i mean there was about you know 20 point lead at one point so the lead has narrowed it's not kept on narrowing and the tories are still ahead and they probably have all sorts of problems um but interestingly, the movement, 
you know, the, the movement um, since 2019 has occurred amongst Romanian Leave voters. So the, you know, Boris is very dependent on Leave voters and he's still very dependent on Leave voters. And that almost undoubtedly provides him with an anchor. You know, there are frankly lots of people who are going to continue to support the Conservatives because they believe in Brexit. Right, and whatever else happens, they're going to vote for the Conservatives because they believe in Brexit. But it has eroded some of the Leave vote for the Conservatives, and equally, it's eroded a bit of its what was left of the Remain vote. It had, but it's been largely across the board, and the Labour Party has gained a bit of the Leave vote and a bit of the Remain vote. So, you know, attitudes towards coronavirus and the handling of coronavirus cut across the Brexit divide, and they just, therefore, as a result, shift attitudes across that division so it's made a bit of a difference but you know not dramatically so um uh, and i suspect a lot will now depend on what happens to the economy i think a lot of the, uh, the the uk government's fortunes are probably currently invested quite heavily in yeah. its attempt to rescue the labor market actually succeeding or not but obviously that's so, so where do you think the the bulk of the remain vote went at the last election especially the conservative or you know, middle oh, of the road, um, they didn't um, want to vote for Corbyn. Where did they go? Oh, the, the remain. I mean, the, uh, uh, just over half the remain vote went to the Labour Party. This is across the UK as a whole. Yeah. Um, about the, the Tories still picked up about twenty percent of it, and the Liberal Democrats had about about twenty percent of it. And then there's a few odds and sods that's going to the Greens, etc. There's about four or five percent going to the Greens. So the crucial point is it's fragmented, right? Yeah. Particularly down south, it's fragmented between Labour and Democrats. I mean the Liberal Democrats at one stage it was really fragmented, you know, and, and Labour and Democrats were neck and neck amongst Remain voters. Well the Labour Party you know, gradually regained, regained ground amongst Remain voters down south. But the point is that you know at the end of the day, you know, the story of the election is quite simple. Labour gets just over 50% of the Remain vote. Uh, Tories get 75% of the Leave vote. The two votes are roughly the same size. Ergo, Tories win. So, um, I've got another question for you here. It may be too recent to tell, uh, but do you think that the recent exam U-turn is going to affect the SNP popularity? Or is the fact that the Tories have had to do the same thing, and of course the publicity for that is just overriding everything? Yeah. Um, I, I think the answer is... Probably not. I mean, I, I formed that view before the thing descended south, although one of the reasons why I formed that view is that you could see it would end up heading south. I mean, somebody, again, this is a question in politics, you need to think ahead. And the Tories and the Labour Party up here should have sat down and realised that if they go for the SNP in Scotland because of the consequences of the algorithm, that they were going to cause exactly the same problem for their own administrations in London and Cardiff. Mm -hmm. But they clearly did not think that far ahead. They, right? they deleted the tweet, didn't they? They, they tweeted out that, uh, and, and deleted it. Yeah, sure, of course. And, uh, and, and the truth is that, but, but, but of course, you know, I mean, I mean, a variety of reasons. One is, um, you know, the, the, the experience of the SQA crisis of 2000, which, you know, pretty serious as it was at the time, in the end, it didn't clearly damage uh, the Labour uh, Liberal Democrat um, administration. Two, we have to remember that, you know, important though it is, it's a relatively small group of people who are affected, even if you take into the parents. It's a relatively small group of people who are who are directly um, affected. Um, um, and in actually in England, you know, the, the A levels is so much of an elite um, uh, uh, exam that you know only half as many people take A levels in England as take highers in Scotland. Right, the highers is a much bigger exam north wow. of the border. Um, but even so, it's still a relatively small group of people who get affected. But yes, the point was, point three was, even before it happened, this exactly the same problem is going to hit the UK government and the Welsh government next week. And it did. And of course, in the end, um, uh, the UK government held on for even longer than the Scottish government tried to do. Um, yeah. And uh, of course, um, Make, as a result, you know, with the UK, with the universities clearing so much further down the track, 
um, uh, being in, making an even more of a, of a muddle. So, yeah, I think almost undoubtedly um, the UK government has uh, helped to rescue John Swinney's skin. And, you know, the Tories will, you know, you know somebody, somebody should have sat there, doesn't it? You know, look, it's no good calling, calling for John Swinney to resign if you uh, discover that you go to, Gavin Williams is going to get the same problem. And they cannot <laughs> now call for John Swinney to resign because if they do, the answer will be, look, you know, what the so, so should Gavin Williamson do? So, yeah. you know, uh, it, it's... Um, uh, so yeah, I think you know, for, for hoist all, by their own petard, as they say. Yeah, yeah. For all, for all of the above, um, the answer is 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 probably not. Uh, and I think in the end, I mean, you know, I think you know, there's serious questions about you know what's been done. In the end, you know, we just end up with the worst of both worlds because we've ended up with even greater grade inflation than we would have had if we just accepted the teachers' estimates. Um, so both everybody ended up making a real. Uh, Pixier of it, it raises all sorts of fundamental questions in the longer run. Um, but um, you know, once the par opposition used its strength in Parliament to potentially bring Sweeney down, they set in train a train of events um, that just ended up um, rebounding and, in the end, um, helped the SNP not look quite so bad after all. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, I'm going to one more question, I think, and then we're going to close up for the night. So it's a question from Margaret. Uh, there's a white paper she's been hearing about, and it involves the UK government taking back devolved powers. Do you think that will be a game changer? Ah, oh, well, this, of course, is a long-standing argument. Um, actually, it the, the, the was the, the Scottish Parliament today was denying, was voting against the Sewell motion to... Um, for the UK government legislation that will allow for the common standards in the single market. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful, it's, it, it, so um, I, I did some research on this quite a while back. So this argument has been going on for quite a long time, um, uh, although it's only hit the legislative stage now. So, you know, we were arguing two years, the argument two years ago was, um, you know, the UK government saying, oh, you're going to get much more powers because they're going to come from Brussels. But the Scottish government saying, hang on, but if we just take the Scotland Act as written, they should all come to us. And that's what the argument is essentially about, right? So it's very easy to obfuscate because indeed the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish government will get more powers than it has at the moment because large numbers of EU competitors will go to Holyrood. But because of the way the Scotland Act is written, the default destination for all of the EU conferences in areas like uh, agriculture and fish and environment go to Holyrood, but the UK government, of course, is assisting on these on these common standards. Um, when I did work on this, and it, this is now about 18 months, two years old, I was doing some work on attitudes to what kind of um, Brexit um, uh, outcome people wanted. And basically what I discovered was that on the one hand, the, the, the argument in the Scottish Government white paper of December 2016, which was that Scotland should be able to stay in the single market, even if the rest of the UK wasn't, and it should be able to keep freedom of movement if the rest of the UK wasn't, i.e. that there should be different rules for Scotland and for England on immigration and on trade, the Scottish Parliament were not willing to buy into that. So that bit of the Scottish Government argument, which would have meant increasing the powers of the Scottish Parliament beyond the, current, the government, beyond the Scotland Act, did not get public support. But when you ask people, you know, who should make the decisions about agriculture and the environment, the answer was the Scottish Government. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, on, and on that, you know, the UK government's not on the, on the right side. But I think, however, you know, this argument's going on for a long time. And it's not clear that the SNP, so far at least, have managed to popularise and politicise it significantly for it to have much impact on public opinion. So yes, public opinion will be brought in sympathy with them, but because it's possible for UK government ministers to say, you're going to get more powers, it becomes a difficult argument to get across. Um, of course, it's, you know, it's, it's deliciously ironic, deliciously ironic. Here is the SNP who are desperate to remain in Brussels, desperately grabbing all the, wanting to grab all the EU conferences that flow as a result. 
And here is the UK government, which is going to break out, is breaking out of the EU single market, desperate to construct a single market inside the United <laughs> Kingdom. But then whoever said that politics was about consistency? And that's a really good uh, phrase to end on. Thank you very much, Professor John Carter. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed that. Um, I certainly learned a hell of a lot. Um, but before I go, I just want to round up a couple of things. We're going to be back online in about 10 minutes or so with a Zoom call. As I said, Professor Curtis can't join us. However, please feel free. Come along. We can chat about what happened. We'll keep that going for as long as people want this evening. Hopefully not too late, though. Um, please, please, please go and give a few quid to PBH Free Fringe. We can't do the Fringe without their help. And they can't do the fringe in future without your help. So it's paypal.me forward slash free fringe. So we're going to give them a few quid. That'd be really helpful. Thanks a lot. Don't forget Skeptics in the Pub event this Thursday. Um, Anthony Magnabosco talking about street epistemology. And next week we've got Emma Bryant talking us about Cambridge Analytica and the whole scandal around Facebook. So they'll be back on eight o'clock next week. So until then, thank you very much and uh, good night. Bye-bye.